Good morning, and thank you so much for being with us. I'm Jim Falk, President of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth, and joining me today is Dion Searcy. She served as Bureau Chief of the New York Times in Senegal from 2015 to 2019. Her memoir, In Pursuit of Disobedient Women, was published just a few weeks ago. Let me take this moment, too, to especially thank two wonderful friends, Bill and Barbara Benick, for their generosity. As we adjust to our new COVID-19 environment, supporters like the Benicks make a world of difference. They are helping keep our council, your council, up and running. If you'd like to sponsor a program such as this one, please go to our website at dfwworld.org or feel free to give me a call or send me an email. It really will help. Now, before we get started, just a few things to keep in mind. Please submit your questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can submit questions at any time, and nowadays you can even upvote others you would like to have answered by clicking the like button on a question. I also ask that you keep your questions succinct and that the Q&A submission box be used only for questions. Please, no conversations or comments because I have enough to keep me busy right now. I know that uh, among today's participants are a number of supporters of our wonderful Dallas Independent Bookstore in Terabang. You can order books from them by authors that are featured in our Zoom cast, and yes, they are still offering free shipping. I'm sure that all of you have read many of the same articles that I have about the challenges that are being faced by our bookstores. So, we got the weekend coming. Please be sure to order Dion's book from interabangbooks.com. Great to have you with us, Dion. Thanks so much. I see that you're, where are you? Are you in your uh, attic? I'm in the attic of my house right now to keep myself away from my kids and my dog and my husband. <laughs> Yesterday, I talked to a friend who was in his closet. So I guess an attic is better than a closet. Yeah, I'm, that's an upgrade, I think, for sure. Well, uh, good to have you with us. And I mentioned uh, in an email, I just enjoyed so much your book, and I know that our listeners and viewers will as well. Let's get started. Um, I, I, I'm sure your, your mother is very proud of uh, how you ended up, what you're doing, but this is not part of the master plan that she had for you, is it? No, not exactly. Um, I grew up in a really evangelical family in small town Nebraska and um, going to church, you know, Sunday mornings, Sunday evenings, Wednesday evenings and other times. Um, and my mom really had plans for me to marry a preacher and, you know, live out my days as a servant of God and being a preacher's wife. And that worked for my sister, but um, that's that didn't really go so well for me. So where'd you uh, go to school, college? So I right, right after college or right after high school in Nebraska, I went to the, the Iowa Christian College, and um, it was a very small campus of fewer than a hundred kids. And um, I snuck out one night and went to a Rolling Stones concert and got busted. Uh -oh. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and um, was facing, you know, all kinds of punishment, even maybe they were talking about expulsion or making me clean the roof or something like that. And I just decided to bail and go to the University of Nebraska. And it was a great decision because um, they had a wonderful journalism program and a great campus newspaper that I immediately got really involved in. And I just loved it. And I haven't stopped since. Did you major in journalism or another? Uh... Yeah, I did. I just undergrad, um, but uh, they had a nice undergrad journalism program. And, but it was really the campus paper where it was just me and my friends, you know, putting out a paper and without, you know, very much oversight at all. So it allowed us to mess up. It allowed us to, um, you know, be creative in ways that weren't as limiting as, you know, if we had a professor hovering over us. You know, we've had the opportunity to interview a, a, a number of your colleagues, journalists, and, including mm -hmm. Dave Axelrod, and I'm always mm -hmm. amazed by just how many journalists have cut their teeth in Chicago like you did. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about some of the most colorful stories that uh, came about during your years in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Well, I worked for a wire service that no longer exists called the City News Bureau, and um, it was this historic wire service that covered 
pretty much only crime, um, crime and, and, you know, the local government officials, um, courts and um, the mayor. And so I immediately, you know, was what, 18, 19 and, or older than that, I guess, early 20s and moved to Chicago from small town Nebraska and um, started working in an area on the south side of Chicago with a lot of crime in um, an area uh, where there were housing projects. And one of the first news conferences I covered was um, the HUD secretary who came to town. It was Henry Cisneros at the time. And he declared um, this particular housing project called Robert Taylor Houses um, the, the most dangerous housing project in America. And that's where I was spending, you know, every night until 11 o'clock. Um, so I really got this window into... Um, a, a different world than I'd ever seen before there. Sure. So what took you to the New York Times and when did you start there? Well, it was a long route um, through many local newspapers, um, but I started there in 2014. I covered the economy. Um, I came there from the Wall Street Journal, so I had some business experience and um, joined the business section covering the economy and writing about you know, all kinds of uh, ways that our economy was being reshaped, um, inequality and, and other areas and how women, you know, in general were, were um, forced to make a lot of decisions between working or taking care of their kids or their parents. I mean, and that's, I guess they call it the sandwich generation, you know, when you have little kids and parents, you're, um, supposed to be supposed to be caring for and then doing housework also at home. So those were some big stories that I wrote. Now, before you applied for the position to be bureau chief of the <laughs> West African uh, uh, office, you had already done some international reporting, hadn't you? Yeah, I'd done a little bit. Um, I did a couple embeds um, covering the Iraq war when I was at a newspaper called Newsday in Long Island um, that you know, like many smaller papers used to have a foreign desk, but no longer does. Um, and I had uh, done, you know, little stints here and there. I covered the earthquake in Haiti, which was a terrible, terrible tragedy um, when I was at the Wall Street Journal. And so I had some familiarity with war zones and disasters, but just a little. I would think, you know, the, the, the jobs, especially now as all newspapers, even the New York Times have, have really reduced their f number of foreign bureaus. It must be among the most competitive positions you can apply for. Um, and, and I'm always been curious how newspapers sometimes will take someone who might not have area expertise mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. yet put them, embed them if you wish, say mm -hmm. in West Africa. Um, right. Just, Sort of the philosophy of editors about taking someone who has not been an area specialist and just uh -huh. want them to sink or swim. Well, I think um, that's that's exactly right. But I think that American journalism, in particular, um, likes generalists, and so they like to place people you know who don't know anything about a situation and just throw them in the water of a new beat, you know, whether it's in America or or abroad. And and the idea is that a fresh set of eyes can see things in a way that other people can't. You know, if you've been if you've been to a, you know, on a beat or in a nation or wherever, you know, for a long time, you're gonna get jaded, you're gonna have these set views. And having a new person come in can just kind of reshape coverage and, and see things in new and different ways. So that's common, you know, um, for the New York Times, you know, all, uh, lots of beats um, are like that. Like our state government reporter now covers opera. So, I mean, it's, it's a bureau, weird thing. How many foreign bureaus does the New York Times have now? Boy, um, how many? I don't know, but you know, all all over the world, we have a big Australia bureau. We have a big bureau in Paris. We have a huge bureau in the UK, in China. I mean, some of our reporters just got kicked out of China. Um, but we have, you know, Latin America, Mexico. Um, in, in the African continent, we have three bureaus: East Africa, West Africa, and South Africa. Um, on sub in Sub-Saharan Africa. So, um, and yeah, and it's more than, than many, many newspapers than probably any major newspaper um, in America. 
So let me remind our viewers, please go ahead and, and write in your questions and we'll look forward to answering as many as we can uh, during our program. So editors and even the publisher of New York Times gave you some advice, didn't they? Yeah, I got an array of advice <laughs> from just about everybody. Um, I was sitting in the newsroom early one morning when I was packing my bags and I saw um, Arthur Sulzberger walk by. He's the publisher and the family, you know, heir to the New York Times. And he walked by my desk and um, I actually remember I was chewing gum and I saw him and realized he was coming from when I swallowed my gum. <laughs> so I was still like, oh no, what does he want? He's after me. Um, but he came by my desk and was really, really nice and congratulatory and um, said one thing he said, if you, he, he turned to leave and swiveled on his heels and came back to me and said, um, just remember, if you, if you come to a bridge too far, don't take it. And then he walked away and there was this eerie silence. I'm like, what is that supposed to mean? <laughs> so so um, that was just, you know, other editors told me, you know, create an Instagram account. Nobody knows what Africa looks like even. Um, other people said, uh, you know, make sure you're really descriptive in your copy because it'll give people a sense of place. Um, because, you know, the truth is that many Americans just aren't focused on African countries and we just don't know that much about um, the continent. Salzberger's advice, perhaps you didn't really appreciate it or understand it at that moment. You did later, didn't you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that um, there were some, some hairy situations that I found myself in, you know, especially reporting on um, Islamic terror, Islamist terrorists. Um, there were you know, just a, a number of situations that I think you find yourself in when you're reporting abroad where you, you push it, you know, you're away from your family for, you know, I was gone for on several instances for a month at a time. Um, and you want to get the story and you feel like you have this real purpose and, you know, you have the government's ear, you have the president's ear, you have, um, you know, the UN's ear, I mean, what you write matters and you really wind up getting sucked in. You know, I think people would be surprised, I certainly was, just how much territory you covered. Yeah. And you were responsible for West Africa. Um, we have this map here. Yeah. Uh, that I think you can see. So yeah, this, and central, it was of where you spent most of your time. Yeah, so I was responsible for some 25 countries in West Africa and Central Africa. I lived in Dakar, Senegal, which was that little point, the westernmost point on the continent. Um, and I spent a lot of time in Nigeria because it's the biggest economy. Um, and so it's, you know, more, I guess you could say more important, you know, to, to, American, to Americans. Um, just because of its scale, it has a lot of oil. There was a war going on with terrorists who had pledged themselves to the Islamic State. I mean, there's, and, and Lagos is one of the biggest cities um, and uh, in, on the continent too. So there were a lot of reasons to tool around there and look for stories there, but I, I got around a fair amount. I mean, one, one piece of advice I got from one editor was don't be a tourist. You know, don't just do toe touches, I guess, in every single country just to say you've been there. Like, really let your coverage guide you. And I really took that to heart. Yeah, and, and how did you decide what stories to run? Or let me put it a different way. How, how many stories were you expected to run? Uh, mm -hmm. and made those decisions. There was no real expectation. I mean, I think a lot of reporters are, are pretty insecure people and we like to see our byline in the paper a lot, you know, just to make sure. Page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just to make sure that, you know, you feel like you're staying relevant. That became, you know, I knew it was going to be a struggle in West Africa for me because um, Americans just aren't thinking about West Africa that much. And then it became all the more of a struggle when President Trump was elected. And I feel like I was abroad when, during this period of insane internal focus, you know, domestically in America, where people were really, really into um, the president and what was happening in the country and not so much 
anywhere, let alone West Africa. Now, another important tool during your reporting, and for all, I guess, reporters who have this type of foreign beat, is you really have to rely on other people, uh, what you would call the, the fixers or mm -hmm. some of the freelance uh, uh, local journalists. Elaborate on that a bit, because that, I found that very interesting in your, in, in your book. Sure. I feel like, you know, no one, I mean, even, even domestically, um, I had a reporter friend who used to always say like every story needs a shepherd. You need like that one source or that one person who's going to kind of guide you around and make introductions and give you the lay of the land. And it's all the more true in a foreign country. You know, I was going to places I'd never, ever, ever been before. I didn't even know how to pronounce until I arrived there. And I really had to rely on local reporters. And, you know, it's it, these, these local reporters, like, you know, it's, it's kind of a crapshoot for them and for me. <laughs> like, you don't know who they are, what their personality is like. You know, you, you um, try to assess them out by word of mouth from other reporters who've worked from them. But, and, and sometimes you, um, you know, I found like some reporters were these, you know, men who were really like, and wanted to boss me around and, you know, not listen to suggestions from me. And then other times you find these miraculously wonderful human beings where um, you have this just amazing connection with and they become part of the family and that was very much my experience and, and clearly that was the type of relationship you had with uh, Jamie Berry and, and and some of the other people that you worked with for sure Jamie Berry was a uh, is a guy from Sierra Leone who um, young a young man who um, had all kinds of experiences living all over West Africa. So he had, you know, been through, he, he helped the times with their coverage during Ebola um, in Sierra Leone and other countries. He had um, this experience of, you know, living on the streets. He was a civil war refugee from, um, and grew up in refugee camps in Sierra Leone in Guinea. He had even tried to sail abroad um, a number of times um, with disastrous ends, <laughs> but, and, you know, mm. just, just in terms of like, you know, he didn't, he didn't get injured or anything, but his ship had to turn around. I mean, he'd had all these experiences of so many other young African, uh, West Africans that I thought that um, just based on his sort of street sense alone, he was going to be a viable and a really great right-hand man to have around. And we became very close. And, and we'll talk about that a bit more because you certainly had a situation that underscored some of the challenges in the, in the medical care, but we'll, we'll go yeah. on. We have a question from Hillary Nugon. Uh, I'm mispronouncing your last name, Hillary, and I apologize for that. But Hillary asks, and we have one or two other questions along these same lines, being a woman, woman and a journalist, what challenges did that uh, bring about? And as Hillary says, have you ever experienced any instances where you feel that there was discrimination or not being respected? And perhaps mm -hmm. she's asking as well as your job here in the United States, but also when you were in Africa. Thank you, Hillary. Right. Um, I think that being a woman in West Africa to some degree was a, you know, sometimes was an advantage, um, especially when I was reporting on other women um, who had been through traumatic experiences like rape or um, kidnapping or, or even um, writing a story about women who wanted to leave their husbands because their husbands were jerks. <laughs> you know, I think that was um, provided some common ground. I think being a woman um, didn't matter as much as being a mother and a wife and trying to juggle and balance, you know, family responsibilities and career ambitions. I mean, that's, that's a really tricky um, tricky line to walk, I think, for um, women, no matter where you are in the world. But I didn't, I felt like maybe some of the fixers who I used early on, um, like I said, like were really, just didn't want to listen to me. And I didn't know if it was because, I don't know, if I was a woman or not, but um, I had that sense a little bit. But in many circumstances, you know, I was a curiosity or, uh, you know, already as a foreigner in a lot of these places, you're so 
different that um, it doesn't matter, you know, whether you're a man or a woman. So we have another question from Andrea Kirsten Coleman. And uh, I, I think you talk about this quite a, a bit in the book about how Africa practically sometimes is viewed as one country monolithic. Yeah. Andrea says, do you think that journalists working on the continent can help reshape the narrative of Africa? And can you give us an example perhaps of how this played out? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that was a huge issue for me and honestly something I thought about every single day. And I tried my best to read all the criticism of Western reporters working in Africa to learn from that. And there were even articles and stories I would go back repeatedly, you know, as kind of a gut check to make sure that I wasn't um, you know, behaving badly or even in the stories that I chose. But I do think that um, for me, I knew that writing about wars and, and, you know, the bad news, it was important. The New York Times is a major platform, right? Um, governments listen to the Times. And I had the power, I felt like, to change um, things by bringing atrocities to light. But at the same time, I thought that that was unfair of, um, of, of what was going on on the continent and all the cultures because, you know, like Lagos is like Manhattan, there are art galleries and, and there are um, restaurants and, you know, bars and, and things like that. And to not, you know, write a story about, you know, the poetry slam in Dakar or the, the gallery opening or something like that was a real disservice. So I tried to balance out my coverage, you know, for every war story I did to try to find um, a story about, you know, runners in Dakar or, um, you know, d different things like that, musicians in, in Lagos who were s struggling with copyright issues. You know, I tried to just make sure that I painted a rounded picture. And also, you know, I did really try to use my Instagram account to show the beauty of the, of the, continent or of the different countries where I was also, because I think that um, just showing people that there's regular life here, you know, was important because so many Americans don't know that. And, and let me take this opportunity to encourage uh, our, our viewers, since we have extra time to read now, is <laughs> what I did over the last few days and go back and uh, look in the New York Times and search some of your past articles because yeah, thanks. Um, many of them are just so enjoyable, but I want to talk about some of your articles that were less enjoyable to read, mm -hmm. and that concerns Boko Haram. I have to say, I did not uh, remember Muhammad Yusuf. I was so mm -hmm. focused, really, on some of the terrorist acts and and and, and that have, have occurred over the last many years. Take a few minutes and and tell us about Muhammad Yusuf and the movement. And, and, and how really his uh, execution or killing uh, took Boko Haram in a new direction. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, Yusuf was a very charismatic um, you know, Muslim leader who operated out of a town called Maiduguri in northeastern Nigeria. And his, you know, his message was religious, but also, you know, commingled with a notion um, that that people in northeastern Nigeria and rural Nigeria were suffering at the hands of government neglect and government corruption. I mean, this is a place where, um, you know, people were living hand to mouth and government officials were living in mansions. I mean, it was, it, it was the, the inequality and government neglect, you know, really, really drove the movement in the beginning. And I think to some degree still, um, for sure. And, um, you know, these, these guys were young, young folks growing up in a place where they would see the wealthy governors and send their kids abroad to the West to go study for school. And these kids would come back and take their dad's places, you know, on the government rosters and do the same things and steal money from the people and, you know, neglect people. And, 
And this whole notion, um, Boko Haram means Western education is forbidden. You can kind of see where that, start to see where that comes from um, and how, um, you know, these guys who are uneducated and poor would see these, these <clears throat> governor's kids go off and come back and do the same thing and the pattern repeat itself. And so um, Yusuf, what wound up happening is the government got increasingly worried um, about Yusuf and um, took him into custody at one point and killed him. Um, just an extrajudicial killing and that set everything in motion and incredible violence broke out and really has not stopped since then. He was replaced. He was yeah, he was replaced by another leader called Abubakar Shakao and Shakao, um was maybe, I guess, less thoughtful um, and just very, very violent. And, you know, you talk to government officials and they say, oh, he's crazy, he's a madman, and possibly. Um, and, and since then, right yeah, and since then, Boko Haram has broken into factions and pledged loyalty to the Islamic State, and it's just gotten um, pretty out of hand. So one of the things that, that I felt in reading your book is we became so focused on the 250 girls from Shibok that we really st you know, stopped looking at other stories. Yeah. And in a sense, did that make us take our eye off some of the other atrocities that were happening in, in Nigeria? Yeah, I think perhaps. I mean, I think um, these girls who were kidnapped by Boko Haram and who, um, if you remember the social media hashtag, bring back our girls, um, how Michelle Obama had, you know, stood with a poster and uh, Ellen and, you know, all, all these Sylvester Stallone and all these other stars got involved with um, this hashtag. And, you know, these girls were, were kind of celebrities in their, um, in their kidnapping. And really, it's all the world focused on when they thought, if they thought about Boko Haram, that is what they thought about. And there were so many other young women and young men um, who were kidnapped, who were killed. I mean, right before those girls were kidnapped, the Chibok girls, there were some more than a hundred kids, boys burned alive in a school by Boko Haram. And no one ever remembers that or talks about that when we talk about Boko Haram victims. It became really focused on those Chiba girls. And, and what, what you also describe is just how difficult it is for them to come back to their families and, and to their communities. Right. So half of them have been um, rescued or released through hostage negotiations that the government um, put forward. And uh, when they were released, the government immediately, the president immediately had them detained and they couldn't see their parents for months and months, maybe even more than a year. Um, or if they saw their parents, it was only for just a couple minutes uh, in under really weird circumstances. And the government, I, I remember the president, you know, parading some of the new releases in front of um, the cameras and yet the parents couldn't see them. But and so are they afraid they were terrorists or yeah i mean there's so much stigma i mean you could I'm, I'm sure they wanted to get intelligence from them too you know wanted to hear what they had to say but they're also i mean the thing about anyone who has spent time with book around people are so afraid of that group that there is a huge stigma that maybe you know maybe they have um some sort of sympathies. I mean, not all of the Chiba girls, by by and large, I mean, many of them were not raped, but a couple were, and um, a couple had babies. And there's this massive stigma about these babies, right, and about these women, um, because people weren't seeing it as rape. They were seeing it as, oh, she had sex with a fighter. And so that, that went beyond, you know, the Chiba girls for sure. But those those girls, you know, were detained for many, many, many months and then moved to a college campus where their um, freedom was also restricted. What about some of them who have had children? How do you think they'll be viewed? You know, we've seen the same things in our country sometimes with children yeah. born offspring in, 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 in war. 
Yeah, right. I mean, I don't know how that's going to play out. Many of them are, have not returned to their own communities. I mean, there are only a handful of them who, out of the ones who were released, who had babies, like maybe four or five even. Um, but I've talked to other women who um, actually lied about where their babies came from. They would say, oh, this is my sister's baby, or oh, I had this baby before I was kidnapped. I mean, many, many, many women wanted to hide, or, or they would call their babies their little brothers and say that their parents were killed or something. And so um, because there were instances of beatings um, of, of people who, once it was realized that, you know, they were the offspring of Boko Haram. Well, in many cases, as you talk about, the women had the choice of being raped or becoming a suicide bomber or being married. And yeah. that's a story, an angle that you really worked at trying to, 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 to get and eventually were able to interview young women who had were, were going to be suicide bombers, and fortunately for them and for others, they were not successful. Go in and tell us more about why you thought this story was so important and, and, and perhaps highlight one or two of the women that mm -hmm. really made an impression on, on you. Sure. Um, I had started hearing about women suicide bombers and, and girl suicide bombers. I mean, many of them were teenagers, and it was you know, that was a curiosity, right? Like, there aren't that many women, I mean, there aren't that many suicide bombers in the world, but there also aren't that many women and girls suicide bombers. And so uh, over the course of, you know, a few years, I slowly pieced together what was going on. And this was at the same time when the government was saying, oh, those women are brainwashed, they're, um, they're fighters, they're supporters of Boko Haram. And I recall I was driving around in my Dubri um, with my fixer and good friend Shehu Abubakar, and we were passing a billboard, and it was a giant, like a PSA billboard that said, um, parents, don't let your children, don't let your daughters go off and become suicide bombers. And it's like, what, what parent would hand your daughter over to Boko Haram to be used as a suicide bomber? And it just the messaging was so screwed up that I really felt compelled to try to sort out what was going on. And so my um, fixer Shehu helped me find 18 girls um, who, all of them teenagers, who had um, been forced to wear a suicide bomb or take a bomb in a bag and, and were told you know, at gunpoint or um, with all kinds of threats that they had to blow up a checkpoint, blow up a mosque or whatever, and had all of them had found these very clever ways to get out of it and surrender and get around um, Boko Haram's orders. One of them I met who made a huge impression on me was a woman called Balaraba Muhammad. And Balaraba had been deployed as a suicide bomber. I think I counted four different times and either got out of it by feigning illness or, um, or actually being ill um, in one case. But the most amazing thing was she was sent with five, I think five other girls and, um, to go blow up a mosque. And the girls, you know, talked amongst themselves about what they should do and considered blowing themselves up because they didn't want to kill other people. I mean, they were talking about suicide and they passed a well and they stood around and looked in the well and wondered like, could we just throw our bombs down there? And they wound up taking off their hijabs and tying them together and lowering the bombs into the well and just running like bats out of hell out of there. And um, the, fortunately, there was water in the well. The bombs didn't go off. They went back to camp because they were lost and um, they didn't know where they were. And they thought that if they were if they went into the town, they would also be arrested or shot because that often happened to girls come, coming into new towns um, from the countryside. They were just shot because they were presumed to be suicide bombers. So they went back to the camp and told Boko Haram, we did it, we blew you know, this up and they were celebrated. Boko Haram was like, yeah. And then they were deployed on even more missions because Boko Haram thought like, oh, you're a ruthless killer. You, know, you can go out and do more. But every time they found a way out of it, and I thought it was really brave and amazing. 
Let me bring in uh, one of our viewers, Maria Vieira Williams. She asked, did you ever cover FGM or female genital mutilation? And sort of give us a sense of the pro and con views that, that, that you heard. You know, I didn't cover it extensively, but I did wind up going to a fistula clinic um, in rural Niger. And that's when the lining between, you know, the vagina gets like blown out when you are really little and when you're young and have a baby, basically a baby that's too big to pass through, um, you know, your, your birth canal. And um, at that clinic, the doctors were telling me some pretty shocking stories of um, FGM. It, the, the good news is that is on the wane, um, that more people, more governments are banning it. And even though the bans, you know, aren't always enforced, that there are, you know, I, th I think it's, I, I recall a colleague of mine doing a story directly about this. And I think more progress than ever before has been made on that. But you know, there were awful stories. I remember um, one doctor told me that there was an affliction called, that he called an affliction, the concrete hymen. And it's when women wouldn't, I mean, this is really gross, but when women didn't enjoy sex, um, then they would go in with a razor. And, you know, um, if, if a woman was resisting sex, they would, you know, just mutilate her. And, and that was the kind of, some of the kinds of cases that they were seeing, but even that um, was on the wane and on the decline. But, but just to give a, you know, perspective on that, the fistula clinic was located right next to the leprosy clinic. That's how stigmatized, you know, um, these, these women were who were suffering from this. We have two questions from different viewers about, again, Boko Haram. Uh, Stephen Cox says, can Boko Haram be compared to any extent with popular, populist uprisings around the world? And then Ode Karash says, uh, has Boko Haram uh, have any ties, does Boko Haram have any ties to ISIS, into the yeah. rise of ISIS? Sure, I'll um, answer that one first. Um, Boko Haram pledged allegiance to ISIS in, I think it was 2015. Um, and took orders from ISIS main and then split into factions because ISIS main um, got upset that they were targeting regular civilians. And so Shakao's group broke off and kept targeting civilians. And um, this new branch called ISWAP, like the Islamic State in West Africa province, I think is what it's called, um, was focusing their operations on um, targeting military convoys and installations. That has since um, gotten a little messy. There are even more factions, and it's kind of just up in the air. And ties, you know, whether, whether people are still taking orders from regular ISIS is, I don't know. Um, it's, it's a little bit in disarray now. But can you compare it to other populist uprisings? I mean, I think Think you can definitely compare it to other terrorist uprisings. Like if you look in northern Mali, that was all about neglect. When, when Al Qaeda, um, the branches of Al Qaeda went into northern Mali, they were setting up government. They were picking up trash. I mean, they were doing all this stuff. In, in ISIS, my colleague Rukmini Kalamaki has written the same kinds of stories. You know, they were setting up in, in Iraq. They were setting up government institutions in places that had never, you know, had just never had any kind of government services before. And so you can see the, maybe not the appeal of these groups by the population, but definitely the, um, the tolerance and why, why, you know, people didn't rush to turn them in. I mean, in, in some areas, Boko Haram and Al-Qaeda were giving veterinary care. I mean, and these, you know, these guys, all they have are farms. And so all they care about are their, are their, you know, herds of cattle and chickens and whatever else. And these guys were helping their animals not get sick. And that's more than the government has ever done for anyone. So you can see how these, um, how these organizations kind of carry on. And indeed, that's what's happened in Egypt in the past with the Muslim Brotherhood could provide yeah. services that the government was unable or unwilling to provide. 
-hmm. We have a question from Brucey e. Mark in Virginia. What would you say are the three biggest issues in West Africa? And are they different than say other parts of the continent? I would say that the biggest issues in West Africa are the biggest issues the whole world has, including America. I mean, I, I try to base every story on these themes. Let me see if I can remember them all. Climate change, changing demographics, urbanization, um, you know, people leaving the countryside, moving to the cities, the rise of extremism, and there's one more, but all those things are happening in America. I mean, America right now is obviously consumed by the pandemic, but um, you know, we're seeing the, the rise of racist extremist groups in America. Um, climate change is having a huge problem. We have this weird changing demographics of like, you know, a lot of old people and a lot of young people and also of, of communities that are um, more people of color are moving into in rural areas. I mean, all these things that are going on in West Africa are global themes. And that's why I, you know, think that some of the stories are so relatable because, um, you know, this is something we're all going through to different degrees. Michael Romer has a, a different approach or a different way to ask this question um, because you touched on some of it, but I think this question is very interesting. Did you work with or did you meet, interview any men or women who were unsuccessful, unsuccessful suicide bombers who regretted the fact that they were unable to carry out their mission? No, I definitely didn't. And, and you know, maybe that exists, but I never met anyone like that at all. Um, I think that there are very nuanced um, situations, right, where children were kidnapped and became co conscript. I did, I did a story about, you know, one, one girl in particular who sticks in my mind who she had been kidnapped. She saw her parents slaughtered in front of her, um, and she was ordered to kidnap other girls the way that she was kidnapped. And you know, and, and other girls who had been ordered to carry guns and raid towns. And one girl, you know, said to me, you know, when I shot the gun into the air and screamed, you know, as we were raiding, um, all the Boko Haram members cheered for me. And, you know, she was like, it felt really good. Like they were supporting me. They thought I was cool. And, you know, I feel like that's, that was really relatable. I mean, how many times have you done something bad when you're egged on by somebody else because you want them to like you? You know, there were just some really fascinating um, experiences. And, and But a lot of these kids were just that. They were kids. I mean, and they were looking, they were alone. They had almost always had family members killed. Um, in front of them to wind up where they were. And that just shows you how, you know, a mom would never give away her kid. But, um, you know, I also interviewed um, some commander's wives who had been um, rescued um, by the military and put in a special detention facility by the governor of Borno State in Nigeria. And those commander's wives I thought were really illuminating um, what they told me because, you know, Boko Haram had kept coming to their house and wanting to marry them and they didn't want to do it. And finally, you know, they, they would offer them food and they were really hungry, but said, no, this one woman in particular, Aisha was her name. And finally the guy offered her like a $500 dowry and she just couldn't turn it down because she knew it would support her family and her parents. So she did it and she went to, went to live um, in the Boko Haram camp and you know, her life there was actually better than it would have been at home. At home, she would have had to be out in the fields. Um, they wouldn't have had that much to eat. At the Boko Haram camp, she just had to cook and clean. It wasn't that, you know, wasn't that taxing. And I began to think of them, um, these women like Carmela Soprano in The Sopranos, <laughs> Because, you know, it was like this, this blinders, like, oh, I don't know what you do when you leave the house, you know, but they were just benefiting from the good thing. And in many ways, it was better than, you know, the life that they could have expected. They, they probably couldn't have picked their husband anyway, you know, it would have been a forced marriage, so. Uh, Karen Jacobs has a, a question going back to, to you. How <laughs> did your evangelical, evangelical background shape perhaps your, your views and perspectives? 
Well, I think it shapes my views and perspectives kind of generally um, in any sort of, any sort of situation I cover. I mean, I think, you know, you think of big city um, urban reporters as like, oh, they're probably going to skew liberal whether they, you know, intend to or not. And, and I think a lot of people I know, um, you know, grew up in really liberal households and just have never been around anyone from a small town. Um, you know, I think Manhattan people are some of the most provincial people I know <laughs> because they never, they never leave the city. Um, but I think that, you know, it helped me. I, I had mentioned um, to you, Jim, earlier, I was just in East Texas doing a story about abortion sanctuary cities, right? And my mom is very pro-life, and I grew up, you know, in a family that was really pro-life. And I understand those sentiments maybe in a different way than someone who didn't grow up like that does. And, you know, it helps me really, um, I think it offers some empathy in, in different ways than maybe people who didn't grow up like that. I hope so, at least. I'm so happy to see this question from Alana Bornostro because she asked about the late Georgianne Geyer, who I'm privileged to say was, was one of my friends. And Alana says, Georgianne Geyer, one of the first female foreign correspondents, described the changing role of the correspondent in the 1970s, 80s as the new diplomats, the new intermediary in the world, since diplomats could not get in to meet with the revolutionaries. Um, do you see parallels in your work today? Because clearly you were able to meet with people affiliated with Boko Haram, where yeah. the ambassador was not. That's, that's exactly right. I mean, I don't know that I would call myself a diplomat. I did plenty of stories, you know, that our government didn't like. <laughs> but um, but uh, I think that, I, I mean, I would have a, one ambassador in particular call me regularly to download him on what I saw, you know, out there. Um, I think that a lot of diplomats, you know, it, it's interesting, like American diplomats just can't go into places that are dangerous. And it's unfortunate because A, it's not that dangerous. I mean, you know, my degree is a city of like 2 million people who aren't dying. They're not all dead. You know, you can go there and, and be safe. And just the value in going there and, and talking to people. I mean, like these guys on, in this image were hunters who had taken up arms against Boko Haram, you know, on, they, they were out like chasing rabbits and squirrels, not squirrels, but just little, you know, guinea fowl, I guess is what they would hunt out in the forest and decided that they could put their weapons to better use in going and fighting Boko Haram and, and to meet with them and to talk to them about, you know, their efforts and how personal it was. Many of them had sisters who were kidnapped or brothers who were killed. And, I just think that that is something that is so important that many diplomats from Western um, countries are missing out on by not being able and having these severe restrictions on their travel. And I have to say, one of the reasons I did enjoy your book so much is it's not just a, a, a rehash, if I may say, of stories that you wrote. It's really a personal memoir, too, of the decision to move to mm -hmm. for this post your relationship with your husband, the three children, and Rachel Vogel here in Dallas says, what was it like to move your family to West Africa? Well, it was pretty strange. Um, it, was, it was slightly better than, I mean, I think our kids were pretty little. They were in second grade and fourth grade. I have second grade twins and a fourth grader. And so the move there and um, the repositioning there, I think was easier for them because they didn't have, you know, long time friend groups or anything like that. It's not like they were teenagers, but um, the, the campus where they went to school, it was an international school and it was beautiful. And they met kids from all over the world, um, not just from Senegal, um, but from all kinds of countries. And, you know, my son right now has a little Instagram chat group with kids who, who live, you know, have moved from Dakar and are all over the world. And I think you know, those kinds of connections are really important. And it, but it was hard, you know, they were scared and nervous. Um, 
but they did pretty well. I mean, I'm honestly pretty surprised that we didn't have more problems. I think what it was kind of- What about the re-entry to the States? Well, you know, they're all in middle school and I think no matter where you are, that's gonna be tough. But um, we did, we had some interesting times getting them assigned to a school. Um, they, we moved back in July and um, they weren't assigned a school until the day before school started. And so we were like, okay, you're going to start taking the subway and bus by yourself tomorrow. And they were like, what? <laughs> but, you know, they adapted. I mean, um, kids are pretty resilient. And um, they also, by the time we decided to move back, they had been in this school where so many kids were in and out. I mean, West Africa for many companies and for the UN and other places is considered a hardship post. So nobody stays for more than a few years. And so there was just a constant cycle of kids in and out. And so by the time it, um, we were thinking about leaving, you know, my daughter was like, let's move to Tanzania. And, you know, she, they just, had these ideas of okay, we've done this once, we can do it again, and it'll be fine. So I but hope that I hope we not not to continue as a foreign correspondent. You had the opportunity, but you really had to respect your your husband's career. Yeah, I mean, oh man, it was such a hard decision. But um, my husband had taken a back seat, and I was a breadwinner in Dakar, and um, he had, you know, really scaled down his, um, his work so that he could be the primary parent. And it was the first time we'd ever had to make any kind of individual sacrifice between us. Um, we had always, our careers had kind of always progressed in tandem, even after we had kids. But, um, we were in such a rut, I think, in New York with like these three little kids and birthday parties and soccer games and, you know. And traffic. Yeah, all of all of the everything of like city life. And my husband really wanted to move to the suburbs and I really didn't. <laughs> so I'd always wanted to work abroad and it just seemed like let's just, you know, pull the plug here and and restart in a really dramatic fashion. And and it was great. I mean, I think in a lot of ways it worked, in some ways maybe it didn't, but um we're kind of back where we started now, living in New York with two careers. But um, I think we have a lot of that experience under our belt and we're um, able to manage the, the give and take a little better. Well, we have just a few more minutes and we've gone about over 50 minutes without mm -hmm. saying coronavirus. <laughs> but now I do need to ask you, and especially when, you, when I think about what you wrote in one chapter about Jamie's accident and how he almost lost his leg. And frankly, if, if you hadn't been so committed and if you had not had the backing of the New York Times, he probably would have lost his leg. And when I read that, thinking about the virus, I can't imagine how serious it's gonna be. There, the number of cases in Africa reportedly are still unbelievably low, but I have uh -huh. to feel want your perception on this, that it is because they just aren't testing? Well, in some places they are. Um, they are testing in Senegal um, a lot, and that's good. In other places, you know, I think, hmm, I don't know what to think. I mean, clearly if it comes to um, a lot of these places where that already have bad pollution, um, so people's lungs already maybe aren't in the greatest shape that they, they could be if they lived in a better, a better spot um, and in crowded conditions. I mean, I think we're going to start in huge ways seeing how the virus affects vulnerable populations in America, you know, let alone in West Africa um, in, in dramatic ways. I think um, some nations have started already, you know, early, relatively early, I guess you could say, for the low number of cases of putting, you know, shelter in place orders in. Um, there's strict curfews. Um, I don't know what to think. I mean, I really would love if, you know, these, these communities, if it doesn't hit Africa. And I've talked to a number of Americans who, in fact, view staying in African countries as a safer bet right now than coming back to America. I mean, it's, it's a pretty um, dramatic turn of events. And you have an international NGO setting up tents um, for a treatment center in Central Park 
I mean, I think that this is something that Americans aren't used to, you know, accepting help like that, um, supplies from, that are being flown in from China. I mean, all this kind of stuff that we've, we've done, you know, in the past to places like West Africa. So I'm hopeful that um, things are going to be okay. But, the, you know, the healthcare system, for sure, I mean, we had trouble getting Jamie an x-ray, you know, and... Um, well, more than that, you, you did, but you also yourself had to get the drugs at two yeah. so that the doctor could even uh, do the surgery. Yeah, I just didn't really realize quite how the system worked, that um, it's on the patient and the patient's caretaker to go buy the drugs, um, to provide the bedding, to provide meals in, in a hospital. Um, I, I just had no idea. It was such an eye-opening experience um, helping Jamie. And I think you're right. I mean, Jamie even recently um, was suffering from malaria and told me he went to the same clinic that had treated him before. And Jamie has, you know, money in the bank and everything. And they, they but it was the weekend and they wanted him to put some $2,000 up front to get mm -hmm. the malaria treatment in case he needed to be admitted and, you know, have more costs. And he couldn't get to the bank because it was closed. And you know, I just feel like there's this discrimination um, against regular people sometimes. And this, it's like this weird white privilege situation that, that comes to bear when you walk in to a clinic as, you know, a, a foreigner. And um, there's just this, you know, oh, okay, well, you can probably pay. And it's like maddening. It's a maddening situation. Tell our viewers about the, I think it's probably the last big article you had in the Times or just a few days ago, the lessons of the election of 1918. Yeah, yeah um, I worked on a story about um, how, you know, the, the Spanish flu and um, the virus had split, spread during midterm elections in 1918 and what various states had done. Um, it's pretty fascinating. There was one, one place in particular that's on my mind right now as Wisconsin um, says that they're gonna push ahead with the primary elections. But in, in a tiny community of Wayne, Nebraska, um, they had, uh, were experiencing a second wave of the Spanish or the, the 1918 flu, um, which is second wave is terrifying to think of right now. But, they were experiencing a second wave and um, that they had this election. It was an important election. It was going to be a close one for the Senate race, the U.S. Senate race in Nebraska. They decided to lift the quarantine and let people go to the polls. And there's just a direct chain of evidence that shows that a number of people got sick from that experience and died. And um, it's terrifying. I don't know what we're going to do. I mean, fortunately, we have the option of um, absentee ballots and mail, mail votes, and hopefully um, everything will work out toward that end. We have a lot of time to prepare for the presidential election, but we also had a lot of time to prepare for the virus's arrival here, you know, if we were paying attention to China. So I don't know how it's going to work out. No, I think you're right. I think we need to at least, hopefully people are being very proactive right now in thinking about the what ifs and how we would have an election in, in yeah. November. Yeah. Let me take this last question from Rowan. After encountering so many situations, and, 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 and we certainly see this, you, know, and you have such a positive attitude, <laughs> how do you maintain that when you've seen such misery in parts of the world? Oh, well, I really tried to, you know, use that misery to find the, the that sounds cheesy, the hope or the, the bravery. And, and to look at people not as victims, but as survivors. I mean, that was true with the suicide bombers who I wrote about. I just thought, you know, they were so clever. I mean, we were walking around the streets, you know, with, with this woman, Balaraba, the bomber who had resisted um, four different times blowing people up. And there were big billboards of Malala. And I'm like, Malala? Like, this is Malala. I'm right here beside Malala. You know, this is your local Malala. Like, put her on a billboard. And, you know, I went to the Central African Republic, which is just, you know, bottoms out the charts on poverty and everything. You know, they're like, 
one doctor for every zillion people or whatever, you know. And I went to a to a clinic where um, they were treating um, malnourished babies. It was an infant malnourishment clinic, basically. And there was a doctor there who I met, and I just, like, you just draw such hope and power from these people. He said, you know, when I was in medical school, all of my classmates did their training abroad because we didn't have, like, the specialty training. And most of them would stay abroad. But I just decided that I could never look myself in the face if I didn't come back and help my own country. And I just, you know, it almost like made me cry just hearing him say that kind of thing. And just, just trying to, I guess, use my reporting to magnify those kinds of stories and, and that kind of really honestly just heroism, you know? I mean, this guy was a hero that he stayed and, and really trying to channel that empathy, um, you know, that we all feel to, to illuminate those situations gave me great, um, you know, made me stay positive, I guess. Well, well, you do it beautifully. And uh, I know when we have events where I'm standing at a podium for telling people why they should buy the books. And <laughs> usually I've read the books and indeed I have read your book and enjoyed it so much. And I know uh, the effort that you put into it. And I, I do hope people that will go to interrobangbooks.com and order a copy today. As I mentioned, it's free shipping. Dion, thanks so much for being with us. And we'll look forward to continuing to follow your reporting. Okay. Thank um, you. A wonderful hour. And let me uh, remind all of our viewers, if you're interested in supporting our uh, programs like this, uh, please go to our website. I'll be honest, I'll be candid, we do need help right now. We're like so many organizations and nonprofits, these are not easy times, and I hope you'll become a member or renew your membership, or do what Barbara and Bill Bennick did and sponsor a program like this. And so what programs are coming up? Uh, next week, April 7th, uh, Ambassador Robert Jordan. Uh, many of you know Bob Jordan. He was U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia from 2001 to 2000. 2003. And he'll be talking with Ben Hubbard. Uh, his book on Mohammed bin Salman was featured in the New York Times, I think just last Sunday. And to have Bob Jordan and Ben Hubbard together, that'll be definitely a fascinating discussion. And then on, uh, let me look down at my notes here. There we go. April 10th, we're going to do a, a discussion with Thurston Clark. And Mr. Clark has written a book called Honorable Exit, American Heroism and the Fall of Saigon. And I've not read that book, but I have to think that there'll probably be some corollaries with Afghanistan. And then on April 16th, Diplomacy in the Age of the Coronavirus with Robbie Gramer, Diplomacy and National Security Reporter at Foreign Policy. And then do mark May 7th. I was talking with Ambassador Mark Grossman today and he is working on a special project with Ambassador Nick Burns and about two or three other ambassadors. And they're really gonna be looking for you, our viewers, to envision for them what diplomacy should be like in the next two or three years. And they started this program sponsored by Harvard even before the coronavirus. And we're gonna be looking for a lot of input from you. We'll be sending out instructions about this program because we don't want you just to ask questions during the program, but go ahead and send comments and remarks so that we'll be able to, to uh, read them and all those ambassadors will be able to reflect on them and really answer your questions. So TGIF, thank God it's Friday. <laughs> I hope everybody will have a, a good weekend and of course, stay well. Thank you so much for being with us today. Goodbye.